Hey guys, this is Dave with Valor Fire Trading. And in this episode of Question and Answer, we have James Johnson from British Columbia. Uh, so James, you and I go back how many years? Like three, four years? Yeah, something like that. Uh, it's been a while now, for sure. Yeah, we, we, we crossed paths and uh, you were kind of the wild and crazy guy that uh, I think we were in Portland and uh, there were some some fun times to be had and we got to know each other and uh, your, your thing is building construction. That's what you're best known for. Um, that's kind of been your thing. How did you get into that? Tell us the story. Uh, yeah, so my um, I kind of worked at an early age doing a bunch of stuff. I moved out of my house when I was pretty young and kind of had to support myself. And I was working restaurant jobs. And I'd heard if uh, if you get into the construction trades, it makes more money. So uh, I was shortly after that, I'd heard that there was a guy who was hiring a carpenter's helper and uh, gave the guy a call. And I've told this story before at different conferences and stuff, but uh uh, I give this guy a call and uh, he's like, okay, I got two questions for you. He's like, uh, first question is, are you a hard worker? And I'm like, yep, absolutely. I'm a hard worker. And then the next question he asked was, uh, can you read a tape measure? And I was like, yeah, who can't read a tape measure? Of course. And I hang up the phone from him and I'm like, I better figure out how to read a tape measure. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so it was before I had, I didn't have internet, anything like that. So I literally, literally had to go to the library grab a book, uh, figure out, you know, go to Home Depot, one of the ones on the shelf and, uh, and uh, teach myself how to read a tape measure. Um, so I started doing, uh, working for him for a little bit. And then I just went through my apprenticeship. Uh, so in Canada, my uh, designation is I'm a Red Seal journeyman carpenter. So okay. uh, the way it works in Canada is you're certified kind of coast to coast. Anywhere in Canada I go, I have that designation. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, so I did that for a bunch of years before I um, got a career job as a firefighter and kind of did it as I was a volunteer paid on call sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, I just always kind of really loved it. was fascinated by it. I think, I think getting into the fire service and doing my apprenticeship at the same time was really key. Uh, cause as, as I was learning the two things, I could see how important they were together. Like how, you know, under <clears throat> always say like, you know, understanding building construction and understanding fire behavior, are absolutely essential to, to being able to do this job uh, well and be proficient at it. Um, yeah, so just, um, and then I kind of found, you know, getting into the world of, of teaching and traveling a little bit. Um, a lot of the people that taught about building construction and did that stuff were, you know, guys that were legends like Vinny Dunn and, um, you know, Brannigan, who's no longer with us and Glenn Corbett and Jack Murphy and all these kind of OGs that um, just weren't out on the circuit, weren't actually doing the teaching anymore. So kind of yeah. fell into it a little bit. Yeah. And it's definitely, you know, I've watched uh, as you have gone around, not just your country, but also our country, uh, you know, and you've taught and I've been lucky enough to sit through a couple of your lectures and uh, it's, it's just amazing. Like you said, you have to know building construction in order to understand fully the fire behavior and where the fire is going to go or where it could go. Um, and, and you and I have had this discussion in the past where in the fire service, we kind of neglect our students when they're first coming into the fire service, because we just give them this brief overview. And it's like, yeah, this is, you know, wood frame, this is masonry, but they don't really get a, a super in-depth knowledge. And so some of the stuff that I've watched you do and, and the stuff that you've preached is just amazing. And it's such a better explanation of how things actually work. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's just one of those things of, um, of actually doing it. Like you can read in a book and you can become a student of something and be really passionate about it. But, um, but just having the, like, you know, when we talk about roofs or we talk about this sort of stuff, like I've spent, I spent a bunch of years framing roofs and spent a bunch of years building houses and doing renovations. And, and uh, so I just kind of feel blessed that I have that, that knowledge. It's not just, you know, I read about this in the book. Now I'm going to, tell you about it sort right. of thing so um yeah. which is which you know, that's, that's me just, that's 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 all me <laughs> well but but for but in the fire service that's that's a lot of us in a lot of things right like until you know a lot of what we have is is just straight up you know knowledge that people tell us or knowledge that we read until we have the opportunity to experience that and, you know especially when we're talking anything fire like you know how long does it take to to gather all those experiences in a fire, you know, to actually get it right. Just not everybody gets fires every day and it, 
you know, takes years to, to gather that, that information. So that's just the, what the fire service really is, is pass down information. And then as we start to gather stuff, then we, then we have that opportunity to pass it on. Yeah. And that empirical in in a more genuine way, I guess you could say, but. Yeah, and that empirical stuff, you know, I mean, it, it, and I mentioned this uh, when we had Lex Shady on that, you know, I had never, when I moved down to Kansas, I had never seen a sub basement, like a true sub basement. And so the first fire that we ran where I knew I was in the basement and I'm still fighting fire, and then I open a door and realize that it goes even further down, I'm like, what is this? You know, but I'd never, I'd heard about them, but I had never actually seen it. And now that's something that I can actually pass on to the newer generations and be like, hey, listen, if you find a door, and there's more steps, you're in a sub-basement, you know? Yeah. You know, it's, it's like something that Aaron Fields talks about where he talks about like the train, the trainer model being broken, where it's, you know, we have this thing where like I learn something from you and then I go to teach it to someone else. And then, right. you know, they, you know, it gets passed on. It's just, it's a system that doesn't work that well. But in another way, like on the other side of it, a lot of times it's hard to, it's hard to find people that have done all that stuff and then have them in the setting where they can teach us. Right. So, yeah. so, so for tonight, you're going to be the subject matter expert. You're the guy. Uh, do you know uh, what? I, 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 I hate it when, it, whenever the word like, you know, subject matter, like expert or guru or any of that stuff comes up, I'm like immediately skeptical of anyone with that title. So let's just. <laughs> so, just and I use that. Because, fireman. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. And it's so funny because like I use that <laughs> as a, a kind of, a, so for the viewers, like just so you know, like I use that as kind of like a, like a poking prod because a lot of us as instructors, we're like, dude, we're nobody from nowhere. Like, you know, as the famous Joe Yeller says, like, we are literally nobody's from nowhere. And, and, you know, yeah, we know some things and we'll tell you about it, but that's always kind of a running joke. It's like, you're a subject matter expert. It's like, I'm not an expert of anything. Yeah. So Tom, if someone, if someone, sorry, I was gonna say, if someone themselves says I'm a subject matter expert, you're like, "Mm, yeah, (laughs) you have to call this guy. You're like, I've heard about you people. I've heard about you guys. I know how this works. All right. So Tom sent in a question. Uh, We actually have two questions. And uh, the first one was sent in by Tom. He says, I have always been taught to sound the floor as I search and have never encountered an actual spongy floor. I was recently told that if the floor is going to collapse, it would happen without any warning. Is sounding the floor still necessary during the entire time you are searching? And for me personally, like this question kind of it stands out to me because I, I personally have never felt a truly spongy floor. Like I've either had a floor or I've had a floor that popped and dropped and I was like, eh, and we got out. Like I've never had that like, Ooh, this is getting really spongy. We should probably back out a little. It, it's never been this kind of slow progression. And so, uh, you know, I think this is something that newer firefighters struggle with and even more senior firefighters, if they haven't experienced it, they struggle with that concept as well. So we're, we're take it away. What do you what do you think? So I think first off, um, we should probably define what spongy means, because um, you hear a lot of people say um, spongy floor or spongy roof, and um, and I think a lot of times people get confused with um, spongy and springy, because there's certain systems, like uh, particularly when we talk about lightweight systems. Uh, Like on the West Coast, we have uh, panelized wood roofs is a good example. Or even if you have a wood eye joist floor system and you go on it when it's new, you can kind of put your weight on it um, and and brand new, newly constructed, constructed properly. It's got some bounce or some spring to it. So that's that would be like a springy, you know, floor. When we talk about spongy floor, we're talking about that that feeling, that sensation of, um, you know, I've heard people describe it as like wet shag carpet, like you, mm-hmm. you step on wet shag carpet, it's kind of got, the, you know, like a sponge. Um, and I, I, have, I wish I could give credit to whoever did this, but I saw someone take those um, big sponges that you use for, uh, for like doing grout, cleaning grout when you towel a floor. And they got them wet and they put them on four corners and then put a sheet of plywood on it, like a small sheet of plywood. You stepped on it and you got that sensation of it actually being like kind of soft and, and, you know, spongy. So that's, I think kind of right off the bat, it's good to, it's good to um, kind of separate, you know, kind of understand what we're talking about with spongy. Sure. Um, but when we look at that, um, 
I, it really comes down to building construction, what you have. Uh, so I, I'm imagining large majority of the, of the people going to view this are from the United States. And so uh, it really comes down to the construction type and then the era of building that you're up against. I believe it was in mid 2000s is when most states in the, in the United States started requiring there to be um, protection on the underside of floor systems. So um, some kind of type X gypsum board or drywall, something like that. Uh, but if you get an older building with true dimensional uh, floor joists and, and it's in an era of building where there's no protection on the underside, you could for sure have burn through of that, of that floor system where you could have holes or, or something could be compromised in that way. Um, when we're talking about floors that, um, that kind of collapse all in one piece or you know, have no indications of it, a lot of times those are those lightweight floor systems um, and also systems where uh, it's quite common on, on uh, lightweight floors to have um, maybe radiant heating, like in-floor heating. And they put like a light topping slab or heavy tile or something like that that would actually uh, mask any of the of the burn through from the actual floor system or the or the decking. Um, so in those those times would be more likely. But I like as a question of should we still sound? Um, I highly advocate for for that just for those cases um, where you know the floor system is still is still like the structural system is still intact, uh, but we could definitely have some holes and things like that. And even if it's not a catastrophic fall through the floor system, anything of, of not sounding and moving where, you know, you put a foot through it or it throws you off balance to a place where, you know, you jar your mask or you drop your tools or anything like that, or end up on YouTube because you, someone's filming it or something. But <laughs> uh, that's why I, that's why I love the approach. Like, you know, all the, all the guys who teach search, you know, you look at the brothers and battle guys and, and, um, you know, moving in that tripod position, getting that mm -hmm. foot out in front, or if you look at nozzle forward or, or, you know, any of the prominent, um, kind of engine company courses, um, having that foot out in front and kind of sounding as we go, um, I think is really key. Yeah. Well, and I don't if that answered the question. Yeah, no, it definitely did. And I think it, it's funny that you mentioned a couple of things that, that kind of caught my, my spidey senses and, you know, early on in my career, um, we had, and, and this had happened prior to us entering the home, but we had, we had a basement fire. We got a good knock on it from the outside. Uh, and this is back before transitional fire attack was the thing. Like it's just, you know, limited staffing. We hit it from the outside and then we went inside. Um, but I remember being in the kitchen and as we were crossing the linoleum floor, I felt like I was drifting. And the guy next to me to my left was like, hey dude, where are you going? And I'm literally sliding across the floor. And what we didn't realize at the time is that the whole floor had dropped. And so it was on a, you know, an incline. And so I'm sliding down across this floor. And when we got to the point where we were up against the corner with the refrigerator, you could actually see where the refrigerator was starting to drop into the basement. And so, you know, it's one of those things where I, I think we take it for granted uh, that, you know, we're always going to have a stable floor or we're always going to have a stable surface to search on. Uh, and so, you know, as I moved into my fire service career a little bit more, um, you know, when I started teaching and you mentioned like brothers in battle and, and nozzle forward with Aaron, um, I was taught by guys like that. And so I kept my foot out. Uh, and now as an instructor, what we're actually showing people is kind of like your uh, guy that was using the sponges. Um, when we do vent inner search to kind of show that floor dynamic we'll take a piece of plywood and uh, we'll either put boards on either end to make it kind of bow in the center or put three or four across to make it stable. So they're sounding the floor, usually like in a concrete burn building, but they get that sound of the wood. And then as they put pressure on it, they can actually feel the difference because if you're sounding it with a tool, mm -hmm. you're not always necessarily going to feel the difference. You might hear it. Um, but it's not until yeah. you start putting body weight on it that it's like, oh, and they know instantly, like, ooh, this doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's certain things, too, when you look at sounding, um, you know, say you just were talking about vent and a search. Vent and a search, if I go in through the window and I have my tool, you know, I sweep to make sure that Mrs. Smith isn't laying there and then I sound. 
Well, if I sound the floor right against the wall, I'm at the, basically the bearing point where the structural members are sitting on that wall. If I go three feet forward, I'm going to have a very different experience when I sound. It's going to feel different. So um, even with even with uh, when you go topside and you're sounding, um, you have to, you know, kind of putting that into play too. Sounding a floor is not just sounding a floor. Um, right. If you're close to that bearing wall, you want to get a little bit out uh, to feel that difference um, and, and kind of know, you know, because right against the wall is not going to be, not going to give you the truest, uh, the truest feeling of what that floor system feels like normally under normal yeah, conditions. Absolutely. And, and again, kind of going back to what we were talking about with the initial education for firefighters, uh, you know, even the little things that you kind of take for granted, like, hey, when you're going up a stairwell, keep your feet on the outside of the stairs because that's where it's more structurally sound. Um, you know, the same thing applies on a bigger room. The corners and the edges are going to be more structurally sound, but they don't, they don't put those two together. You know, it takes guys mm -hmm. like you to go out and be, explain that to people before they kind of uh, line everything up. Mm -hmm. So with your searching, so, and I'm gonna kind of expand on this question just a little bit for my own curiosity. So when you're searching, uh, you know, what is your preferred method, uh, you know, as far as sounding, searching and kind of doing everything? Because we all know that we do it all at the same time. It's kind of one motion. Um, but how do you prefer to search? Yeah, so I, I'm not a fan of having anything in my hands when I search. Um, I definitely, I definitely like just starting from that point. Um, you know, like I'm a, I'm a Halligan guy. That's kind of my tool of choice to grab right away. Um, if I'm, if I'm doing search stuff, but I'm also the guy who's stashing it behind a door or leaving it somewhere because I want to be able, I want to be searching with my hands. Um, I've just, I've always gotten in, um, I've gotten into the habit of like when I'm on the, when I'm on the hose line, um, I, I have my right leg is up, my left knee is down, the hose is draped over my arm, you know, leg. Um, and that's kind of, you know, arm locked in. That's my position for flowing the line. And then when I'm searching, I do the same thing, left knee down, right leg up. I'm in that position. Um, and I'm, you know, using that out in front of me, uh, to sweep and also to, to sound. And then I have my hands, uh, you yeah. know, and it's like, every, like this, you know, people talk about this all the time, but, um, when we go and we teach and, and do classes, uh, you know, the first thing you see when people search is they have the tool and then that instinct is to, is to be swinging that tool around and, and then the clubbing people would, in know, the head. <laughs> yeah. And then it's, it's, you know, it even goes one step further than that. We always say, it's okay. I've got this tool and I hit something. Well, now what do I still have to do? I still have to go and, and feel that to see what it is that I hit. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of, that's my thing is, um, you know, I don't, I don't like to have a tool around. I like to try and be as light as possible, but definitely that position. I'm always same foot up, same knee down in that position, whether I'm flowing a line or, or searching, just, you know, just that muscle memory. I'm a dummy and I have to do it the exact same way every time or, <laughs> or I, or I'll start to mess it up. So I'm a lot like you as far as the search. Uh, and I love the fact that you are into the muscle memory thing and keeping everything the same. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll even take it one step further. Like I enjoy having the same muscle memory from the water application and the search, but then even on victim removal, uh, you know, I'm into the leg clamp. Uh, I first saw it with Gary Lane and it just blew my mind. And it's the same technique. It's, you know, this leg up, this knee down, it just simplifies it. So, yep. Yeah. It's just super simple, super easy. And, and it's, you never have to change your positioning. So I love that. Totally. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So, all right. So I, I want to get onto this next question because I want to make sure we have enough time for that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about whatever else comes up in the conversation. So Amy sent in a question. It says, we didn't get a lot of building construction knowledge except for what's in the book during my firefighter one class. Now that I'm out in the field, I see things that I'm not familiar with. What's the best resource to learn more about building construction and get more comfortable with it? Also, what is the what is your most feared type of building construction and why? Um, mm. So I think that, you know, the second part of that takes a little bit of obviously, you know, thought and, and you got to kind of ponder it for a minute, but 
I know I've struggled with resources. Uh, you've always been a resource for me. I've reached out to you before and been like, hey, dude, what is this? <laughs> so what? how do you, totally how do you tell somebody who has a thirst for more? Where do you tell them to go? Yeah, so um, there's a bunch of different resources. And, and I've always said uh, for a long time that um, part of the problem with building construction education in the fire service is um, we look at the, you know, the average textbook and they'll have, you know, here's the five types of construction, here are some of the materials, and then here's the worst case scenario where those materials have killed people. And there's like, there's this huge gap in the middle where, you know, understanding, um, understanding how they, how these materials react most often and, um, and that. So um, for, for education, there's a bunch of good books out there. Um, and you kind of have to pick and choose parts out of it. Like Brannigan's is the kind of essential, you know, building block of just fire service um, information. Uh, but one that I've t uh, talked about, and I, I think it was probably William Knight who told me about it for the first time, uh, is called uh, Building Construction Illustrated. And it's by a guy named Francis Ching, who's like an architectural draftsman essentially. And he, um, and he does this book and it's all illustrations. So That's it'll be awesome. like everything from foundations to roofs to floors. Um, and it's not, it's not something you pick up and you start reading from start to finish, but it's something that, you know, Hey, you hear something like someone talk about, uh, you know, like, uh, whatever obscure building thing. And then you look back as a reference and now I can see a picture of it and I can see the building components that are associated with it or in the same kind of buildings. Um, so I think that's really key. Um, but it's, it's tough. Like uh, the best, the best thing is getting out and walk in your districts and then going to job sites. There's no, um, there's nothing better than that going out there. And then a key thing with that is if you go out, go out with somebody who maybe had like, hopefully there's someone on your crew or, um, on your company that has some experience so they can interpret what you're seeing when you go there. Um, and so that's kind of key, but um, unfortunately there's, um, you know, there's some good, there's some good textbooks out there, but it's tough to, they're tough to read. It's not like you can sit down on page one and flip through it and have a riveting read for sure. But. So, so what you're saying is there's no building construction for dummies. No, there is. So somebody, some, some Canadian guy needs to, needs to write one of those, I think. Well, and that's, you know, I'm lucky enough that on my volunteer department, we have a guy that does roofing. Uh, and on my career department, we have a couple guys that do construction. And so whenever we do go do walkthroughs, um, they're, they're such a huge resource. I mean, they're so awesome about saying, Hey, this is, this isn't built right. This is how it should look. Or, this is what this is if you've never seen it. So that's always helpful mm -hmm. you know, for us. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. That's so valuable. Yeah. So what about the second part of the question? What's your, what's your most feared type of building construction? Uh, so I don't, uh, fear is a, uh, you know, I, I understand what, what Amy was saying in the, with the question. Um, I don't think we should be fearing anything. You know, even the, even the, um, uh, what's the famous Brannigan quote I'm blanking right now, or it's the, oh, the, you know, the building is the enemy, know your enemy. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't think that we should be looking at it with a negative spin. The building is what it is. It can, you know, it can either help us or it can hinder us. It can contribute to fire spread. Um, and there can be things that cause, you know, can, cannot be good, but there's parts of every building that we can use to our benefit. Um, so I think it's just understanding those things and we shouldn't be fearing any building. We should just understand it. Um, but that being said, there's certain things. And one of them is the, is really the foams and, um, and insulations and stuff that we're, we're seeing in buildings. I think that's one of the more concerning, um, concerning things we're seeing. Um, you see, you know, you can look at some of the UL testing they did with the attic fires uh, if you guys have seen those videos where it's uh, basically like a barbecue fire or like a small rubbish fire on the outside of a building and they compared uh, different insulation styles and you know some of them were you know 20 minutes later and it's still just barely you know melting the vinyl siding and then yeah. other ones it's just a few minutes and it's fully extended into the 
attic space. Um, so I think we're, you know, we're, we're putting these non-combustible combustible materials on, you know, an insulation on different places. And, and that's going to contribute to, um, to real bad fire spread in a lot of places. And, and, uh, you know, kind of things that were that, um, that just make it more difficult for us, um, you know, especially in places where you have longer response times. You know, if you have a six, eight minute resp average response time to a structure fire and you have some of those materials, um, you're in a bad place uh, before you even arrive on scene. So those yeah. are some things I'm kind of most concerned about. Um, there's, you know, there's certain things we're working with the Canadian building code right now to, to get protection on floor systems. So, you know, added protections where you have more, uh, floors are more um, time basically on floor systems so that's something that's like a concern for us in Canada we're allowed to have unfinished basements you can have a wood eye joist floor um, unprotected on the underside and stuff all of your all your shit down there and um, you know Christmas decorations and you know winter clothing and all that stuff and yeah. and uh, that's totally allowed by code um, uh. so that's you know something that's a concern and you you guys have states down there that, um, so it was actually after a line of duty death in Green Bay, Wisconsin, that they, you know, there was groups like the IAFF and, and fire chiefs groups that lobbied for, to get those changes made um, in the code. And, uh, but there's some states that, that uh, opted out of it. Like I know Indiana is one where you're allowed to have unfinished basements there. Uh, so just kind of understanding that you could have lightweight materials and, and have unfinished basements. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and one of the ones that, uh, you know, sticks out in my mind, and I had not seen it until a few years ago, uh, was ICF construction, where you have the foam and then the mm -hmm. concrete and then the foam. And we've had several fires uh, over the last couple of years, and all of the normal things that you think of uh, just kind of go out the window because they're so well insulated and none of the things from the outside uh, you know, with the thermal imager look right. Uh, and so we're, we're learning about them, but that was, again, it wasn't a fearful thing. It was, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Do you want to know something about ICF is when I, my last bunch of years framing full time before I got hired in Vancouver, um, all of the foundations we did were exclusively, um, ICF or insulated concrete form foundations. And I loved them because, yeah. um, you know, if anyone's ever done foundation, if anyone's ever done foundation form work, you have these greasy, oily, heavy forms, you're in some mucky hole, like it's just the worst. And uh, with ICF, you have these clean white styrofoam Lego blocks. Um, you can cut them with a handsaw and you just, you know, have an bad, you don't even need power on site to do the whole foundation. You have a rebar breaker and bender and you have an impact drill that you kind of, um, cleat them all together and boom, the whole foundation's done. It's clean, it's quiet. Um, but man, does it ever um, contribute to some, some pretty gnarly fire. Um, I, it was my connection. Okay. There, yeah. Dave? Yeah. You're good. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I just got the unstable connection notice. Um, so I have a friend who used to be a fire chief at a smaller department, uh, kind of close to where I live. And he had a fire, uh, all volunteer system. He gets on scene and he actually has a picture as the duty chief. He rolled up and he took an on scene picture. And um, I, you know, there's lots of instructors that talk about this, but I hate, you know, kind of hating the term fully involved. Like I truly believe that, you know, there's, we can find survivable space. If it's a closed door or, or something, you know, that's our job, that's our mission. Uh, but this picture was legit fully involved and uh they it was in an area that didn't have hydrant system so they had to they had to tank all the water in and uh so he has pictures of this fire and it was all icf so those insulated concrete forms all the way up to the roof yep. and when the fire was done there was no second floor there was no furniture there was no interior wall coverings there was no roof it was just four concrete walls all the way through and they couldn't put the fire out it basically burnt and consumed everything. Um, so pretty, pretty volatile. Yeah. So the first one that yeah, we that's, ever, that's a good concern. Yeah. And that the, so the first one that we ever had, we didn't know that that's what it was. Um, and I remember standing in the backyard and we were doing a 360 and I heard these 
thumps and I couldn't figure out what they were. And then one of the guys was like, Hey dude, those shingles coming off the roof are concrete. And I was like, what? And I walked over and picked one up and sure shit. It was like a 10 pound concrete brick slate. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, get up, you know, get back from the wall. You know I mean? It just, it, so many things weren't adding up uh, and we were able to save part of the house. But like you said, the bulk of the house that was on fire, it was the basement all the way up through the roof was just empty. There was nothing. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's funny. I, a couple of years ago, uh, I don't know, maybe three or four years ago. Now I did a class at FDIC called what's hiding behind the walls. And uh, the premise of that class was, um, was, it was kind of like a new construction, but also a little bit of a size up class. And so what I did is I had a whole bunch of houses that were um, that I took pictures of kind of roof perv style uh, under the construction process. And then when it was done, I would take, I had a gimbal and a camera and I would film a 360 view of the outside. So in this class, I would show video footage of the outside and I'd get the class, you know, what do you see? What kind of construction type do you think this is? What would you classify it as if you were the first new officer? all these questions. And then I would show them all the pictures of the construction process. Um, and I had lots of weird stuff. So usually the, usually by the third or fourth video, nobody's offering up any opinion because they know it's going to be something <laughs> sneaky or, you know, going to gonna fool them somehow. Um, but one of the houses I had in that, um, that I used for that class was an ICF house all the way up to the rafters. And so when I went by the place to, um, and to ask the homeowners if I could film the outside of the building, uh, the, the guy was like, hey, come on down to my mechanical room and check it out. He's like, we left it unfinished so you can actually see the, the blocks. So, so I went down and, uh, and uh, went and looked at it. And, um, and yeah, the mechanical room, they didn't put any drywall on any of the walls. So it's just, you know, he's got the broiler and the, you know, the hot water tank and all, you know, everything in there was uh, in this unprotected room, basically. My God. (laughs) Yeah, pretty crazy. Oh, that is nuts. Well, yeah. So, so, okay. So I have another question. And then the, you know, again, this is coming from me. I mean, I think, you know, Amy was spot on with the resources and wanting to know how to learn more. Um, As a company officer, there are times where I have felt like I envisioned where the fire was going and I kind of made an estimated guess or an educated guess. And I would say majority of the time I'm right, but there's definitely times where, you know, we pull ceiling and there's no fire. Um, So, as somebody who has way more experience with building construction than me, how do you feel about guessing kind of the progression of the fire and where it's going today in modern construction versus what you knew or what you know about like older style construction? Do you feel like you're just as accurate? Um, you know, I think, I, I think if the building is, is under normal conditions, maybe yes. But I've been caught a lot of times, not, I'm not a company officer, I'm just a, you know, just a backstepper. But, um, but I think with older construction, we deal with so many renovations and so many remodels. And, you know, you have a hundred year old house, how many times have those people or, you know, let's, let's not even say a house, let's say more of a, you know, uh, less uh, commercial, you would say building or something. Uh, yeah. there's how many renovations and stuff have been done that that's the stuff that can kind of trip you up. Those are the times where, where I, you know, I'm caught think expecting something and then, and then finding something else. Um, but also like, you know, with new construction too, modern construction, everything is so engineered and, uh, and you don't really know what to expect because um, you know, floor layout or roof layout or all these things are all based on, What is the most efficient? What is the most um, cost effective? Um, What materials are available? What materials are those design? Is that designer accustomed to using? Um, You know, all those things come into play. So, um, you know, it's, it's tough. It's tough sometimes to, to know exactly what to, you know, where things are going and what's happening. And, and uh, yeah, it's kind of one of those things you can have as much experience as you want. um, But sometimes you just get caught. I think another part of that too is um, what are the tactics that have been, you know, what's happening on scene. And, uh, you know, there's, 
you know, there's lots of departments that still do positive pressure attack where they're, you know, putting a fan in before they have, you know, water or any kind of uncoordinated um, yeah. ventilation is, is going to, is going to move fire around, um, you know, pretty, you know, and you could say pretty predictably sometimes, you know, put a fan at the front door without getting water on the fire and, and it's, you know, it's not a compartmented uh, space. You're going to, you're going to run into some big issues there. So, or even, you know, somebody opening up, opening up the top side or certain things when um, those things can all contribute to, to making things more interesting with what's happening with the fire. Yeah. And I know, especially like in my district and I, and we've talked about this several times uh, in a couple different episodes, but in my district, I will go from a balloon frame construction, two-story house to a, uh, you know, wouldn't I be five-year-old McMansion? <laughs> you know, it's like, I just have a mix of everything. And, and if I get out into the rural area where I volunteer, I mean, I could have a hundred year old farmhouse next to a brand new McMansion, uh, you know, ICF construction. And so it's just, there's so many variables. There's so many different times where I've been like, Oh, fire's going to be over there. And then we pull the ceiling and there's nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And every once in a while, I, you know, I'm, I get caught, but for the most part, I feel like we're, we're pretty good at guessing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of times what it ends up being just guessing. Yeah, for sure. So what questions do you have? Like what, what's something that you get asked a lot or something that you're passionate about talking about? Uh, for me, it's def definitely stuff I ended up talking most about is the lightweight construction stuff. Um, and just me being on the West coast, you know, we have tons and tons of it. And then being a carpenter and framing houses and apartment buildings and stuff. Um, that's definitely what, you know, what I kind of cut my teeth doing the most and are the most familiar with. Uh, so I end up talking about that a lot. Um, yeah, that's kind of that. And then along, along with that, we, you know, we lead into the discussion to a lot of the myths that are out there or, you know, things that, things that were said in the fire service about building construction that, um, you know, might be true the odd time, but are not, ne is not necessarily what happens every time. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, but it's definitely, you know, the lightweight construction and the wood frame and wood constructions stuff that I've spent the most time in. Actually, my first, my first year ever teaching at FDIC, I did a class on tilt up construction, uh, like tilt slab, because we did a bunch of those buildings when, uh, when I was framing too. So it's my first, my first uh, introduction to FDIC was actually talking about that. Nice. Well, and I think you're right. I mean, there's such a fear and, and an unknown of lightweight. And we've all been told, you know, if it's lightweight, you're going to die. You know, if it's lightweight, it's going to collapse in five minutes. And that's not necessarily always the case. I mean, there, I've been on plenty of lightweight construction fires. And I never once thought to myself, oh, man, this thing's going to fall on our heads. I mean, it just wasn't, it never happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, you know, there's, I don't know. I always kind of wonder where these myths came from or where these, you know, statements like, you know, if one trust fails, the whole roof fails, like, right. you know, where did this stuff originated or like, you know, where did it come from? And cause like you ask, like, I've, you know, I've talked about this tons of times you hear, like, I've heard people say that and then been like, be like, okay, awesome. Like where, where like, what do like, do, tell me, when did you experience this or have you ever experienced it? And they're like, no, like somebody told me that. And yeah. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that it can't happen. Like you, there's, you know, we, we say, you don't want to say always and never in the fire service, like things can happen. Um, but just yeah, everybody who's, who's listening in on this or viewing this has been to a surround and drown defensive fire where it got away from you and you're, you know, they're sitting on two and a half and monitors on the street or on the front lawn. Um, if everybody is honest with themselves and thinks about those fires, typically what happens is part of the roof, you know, you know, it'll start to vent and then part of the roof falls. And then the roof, part of the roof that falls gives an eccentric weight on the rest of the roof. And then that next part kind of falls and it slowly falls into itself as we sit there wishing we were inside putting the fire out um <laughs> but it's but it's that's typical that's most of the time how it happens it's not like 
you know, one bottom cord of a truss gives way and the whole thing goes and, right. and falls. So, um, so, you know, you wonder, you know, I've talked about this in my classes too. And, and, you know, there's lots and lots of people who have talked about this, but um, I think a lot of the, the, some of those comments about truss roofs come from old truss roofs. Like you look at some of those arch trusses or those big timber trusses from the East coast. A lot of those trusses are spaced 16 to 20 feet apart. So it'd be 16 to 20 feet between those trusses. Yeah. So if I have one, if one of those trusses fails, you know, that's a 32 to 40 hole in that, in that roof system. That is a big deal. That's significant for people on top or underneath it. Yeah. It's a ton uh, of weight. If we to talking, be for sure. And that's a big hole in the roof that's caused by that. Uh, but if I have one truss fail in a, in a resident, residential setting or a more modern setting where we got 16 to 24 to you know sometimes 32 inches on on some of those uh, residential roofs um i've seen it um you know that's that's a much smaller hole and a much you know different issue than than losing you know 30 to 40 feet so you know part of it might come from from those kind of roofs where you know if you lose one truss it's significant it's it's a big deal yeah, and when you talk about the, you know, myths as a whole in the fire service, we've talked about this uh, in some of our classes, and I love kind of truth bombing people, I suppose. Um, but, you know, we've all at some point in our career, most of us have heard the story of the FBI agents who learned the Weaver stance, and they were, you know, taking the shells out, and they had to put them in a bucket, and then somewhere down the line, they ended up dying in a shootout because they stopped in the middle of the gunfight to put the bullets in the bucket. And I believe that story for like the first half of my career. And then when I actually started doing some research, I found out that the whole thing was bogus. The story actually never happened. Um, there was one case where there was a, a, an officer who had bullets in his pocket but that wasn't uncommon for the time because they used revolvers. So he probably just had extra rounds, you know? And so right. it, it literally, like, it, and if you go back, uh, James Pence was the, the, the officer who was killed that kind of started this rumor um, based off of what the California highway patrol did afterwards. But yeah, there is no truth to it. And we believe that for a long time. Uh, and so it's just one of those things where it's like, well, where'd you hear that? Well, I heard it from the guy that taught me. Well, who, who'd you hear that from? Well, he heard it from this girl from so-and-so. And Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tough though, too, because in the fire service, we rely so much on the senior man and passing down knowledge. And it's, you know, it's, that is so important and, and is something that we want to instill. We want to instill those things. We want to keep those traditions going of, of your senior firefighters passing things on mentoring the younger firefighters that's so key um but it's it, you know it's it's one of those things there's always going to be there's always going to be certain things that get passed down that that aren't necessarily true um or um you know maybe they did happen in some part point and and you know the, i think another thing with it too is is breaking things down to and looking at it like you know there's a lot of it's just anecdotal information somebody you know, I had somebody reach out to me who um, had a part, you know, hearing some of the stuff that I talk about and, and, um, and uh, you're probably, you're familiar with this individual and probably this incident, but I said, Hey, we had, uh, we had a part of a truss roof came down on our guys in a fire. So I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like, let's, you know, let's see the pictures. Let's, you know, get a, a sense of what happened. And um, in this particular case, um, a whole section of the trusses came down. But what, when you look at the pictures and the breakdown of it, the corner, the outside bearing walls of, the, of where these trusses were sitting separated. So the wall separated and now these, this truss section doesn't have a place to bear on. So the whole truss section came down. Right. So then you say, okay, is that like the experience there is we're fighting a fire in a lightweight constructed building. It's a truss roof. The truss roof came down on our guys. That part of it is completely factual, but was it a truss failure or was it a, a bearing wall failure of, the, of right. the structure? So it's like that anecdotal, you know, it's like just because we experience something, you know, we can experience it, but we got to break it down and, and actually understand what, um, you know, what the reason behind it actually was. And, you know, we don't, you, 
all you got to do is look at the UL stuff with the fire attack study and, and all of that. There's, you know, lots of things we said. Um, and, you know, we said, okay, I experienced this, this phenomenon, and this is why. And then, you know, the UL study came along and you're like, yes, you, this is what you were experiencing it, or this is what you were experiencing, but you weren't experiencing, that wasn't what you were experiencing, you were right. experiencing it because, because of this. Um, and so it's kind of important to, to break those things down and look at it as, you know, you kind of investigate the why behind it, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And I've, you know, it, it's so funny because there is a group of firefighters who I have known for years and we are all very analytically based. Like we want to see the data, the research, we want to look at the numbers, we want to understand why things are happening, happening from a scientific standpoint. And then there's other people who usually argue my points every time who are like, well, that's not how that worked because that's not what I saw. And I'm like, but what you saw isn't necessarily what happened. And so, yeah, yeah. it's, it's so true that there's stuff that happens um, that we just take for granted. And it just, you're right. It does become completely anecdotal. Yeah. You take any company, you take any rescue company, engine company, truck company, and you experience something in a fire and you come out and you interview those four people completely independent without them talking to each other, they're going to have four slightly different variations of, of that incident just based because, you know, it's just like anything in life. Like we experience something, but we can only base it off our past experience and our past knowledge and, and that sort of stuff. So we, you know, we have a very, you know, uh, you know, small boxed in view of what that experience meant. If you have a brand new firefighter going to a fire and he experiences something, he doesn't have any of that background experience and knowledge to, to be able to interpret what, what it is that they, what they saw. Right. So that's just, you know, any of us, we can all like a, any four of us could go into a fire and we're going to have a slightly different experience of it. Um, that way, just cause you know, it's that anecdotal in what we experience and we pass it on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, except for the truckies, because the truckies are going to be on the roof. So, you know. Yeah, you know, it's clear up there. They can see <laughs> things more clearly. So uh, here's another question for you. And this is something that uh, I've actually been meaning to ask you. I just haven't had time to call and talk to you about it. So I've been reading a lot and seeing a lot here lately on these mega wooden structures and i know here in the kansas city area uh, a couple of years ago we had a big apartment complex that was all wood frame and no sprinkler system yet and they were doing some hot work the whole thing caught on fire and it started you know i'm sure you probably heard about it it was the royal place and and it like literally caught seven blocks of houses on fire uh mm -hmm. and so you know what i i keep seeing these and i wonder to myself like at what point I mean, it happened in Kansas City. It happened in the East Coast. Like, at what point are they going to be it's, like, hey, oh, this is a really bad idea? I wish I wish I had the number. I have such a horrible memory. But um, so for, for those tuning in that may not be familiar, there's a gentleman out of New York uh, and New Jersey area. His name is Jack Murphy. Um, he's one of the, like, if you've ever been to FDIC and you've ever seen Bobby walking around, Jack Murphy is Bobby's handler. He's basically there helping Bobby get from place to place. And uh, Jack is an absolute wizard. He's been in the, the building code and the fire marshal world forever. Uh, but he keeps track of all this stuff. And, and uh, I think it's some of his numbers go back to 2015 or 2016. I'm probably misquoting it horribly. But, but I know for it's like, you know, 30 plus of those buildings have, have gone up. It's the numbers huge. You know, there's ones in, I think there was multiple ones in Oakland and there's yeah. East Coast, there's, you know, Edgewater is one in New Jersey, there's a whole bunch, that one was actually completed and people were living in it. Um, but there's lots of those, you know, four to six story wood frame buildings. And, you know, once they go, they, they go. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know, you know, I've pondered this lots, I don't know what the solution is for, for doing it, because, you know, wood construction is you have to get to the top and you have to put a roof on it before you can before you can start to put the passive protection in yeah. uh you know the drywall or anything like that and if you're in any place that has any sort of moisture we don't want to be covering up those walls until we have the opportunity to to you know kind of dry things out and let them um you know come to a good moisture content uh because then we'll run into mold and so it's just this tough situation where i don't know what the 
what the uh, solution is, but it's definitely a problem. You, when they go up, they go up and, you know, you run into, you know, like you said, you know, multiple city blocks and uh, it's, um, that's a big thing, so, you know, and, and uh, so there's been a lot of talk about mass timber, like the wooden high rises, the big tall ones. Yeah. And a lot of people have kind of, a lot of people have, you know, gone crazy and started freaking out about it. And, and, um, and I'm way more concerned with those four to six story wood frame, you know, typical wood frame buildings than I am any of those mass timber buildings, just because those mass timber buildings, there's no combustible void spaces. Um, you know, there's solid mass. It's much, much, much different, you know, animal. I'm sure there's going to be concerns for those as they age out and, you know, sure. as people want to build higher and higher, but you know, those four to six story light wood frame buildings um, under the construction process is uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, something to be concerned about. Yeah. And, you know, I think we've, we've all watched the video of some of the ones around the country, but when the one happened in Kansas city, uh, it was just talking to talking to people that were there. Um, it was insane. I mean, it was absolutely absurd. The amount of fire and the amount of, I mean, they had 32 units. It was like 22 structures simultaneously on fire. And, you know, we, we just, even metro wide, there wasn't enough resources to handle that. Uh, mm -hmm. And and then in the middle of it, the the CAD system went down, and they were having radio issues. And it's like, oh, uh, if it, yeah. it just it was horrible. And then you know we saw the same thing happen in Virginia, and it was like it's a repeat. It was an exact repeat yeah. of what happened here. So yeah, I've, I not yeah. unlike yourself, there are so many people I've talked to that just don't understand why this keeps happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just once the building's built, as long as you have a jurisdiction that has a full NFPA 13 sprinkler system, which uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, it means there's basically sprinklers in all the void spaces, um, not just in the occupied spaces. Uh, but once it's done, all your passive protections in and you have a full 13 system, it's a fine building. It'll, yeah. it'll do its thing. But until you get to that point, um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of hazard in there, um, definitely during while it's being built. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of what the future holds with that, um, especially with the high rises. You know, that was, uh, I know that was a lot of eyebrows raised when those started kind of popping mm -hmm. up. Well, yeah, we're in, in Vancouver where I work. We have, uh, we had the first one of that, uh, like of a high rise setting in North America. It's called the Brock Commons Tallwood House, 18 stories of mass timber um, built on our university. Um, kind of in right in the middle of our university and and uh, yeah so that was a number of years ago now so we've kind of kind of been on the the front lines of that and then and then watching it all happen yeah I'm sure just sitting there biting your nails <laughs> well do you know what the one that we have in Vancouver um, is I, I don't foresee there being any issues with it because it has three layers of five-eighths drywall on every wood surface Really? And then the floors have, have a, a concrete topping slab on it. So there is zero exposed wood in that. Okay. Building. So they, they so did it smart. They, they, <laughs> they did. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very, it's very, uh, uh, very well protected from that side. So. Very cool. Very cool. Well, James, I can't thank you enough uh, for joining me. It was, you know, I, I there's, uh, I haven't, I was just saying this earlier, uh, you know, I have not struck out yet with any of the guests, you know, it's been so cool to have everybody on. Uh, I know that we'll have you back at some point. Um, you know, there's always these questions and, and the people that have sent in the questions, again, I say this almost every time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sending these questions. We wouldn't be able to do it without you. I just have to make this crap up and I'm not that good. So it's, uh, it's definitely, it's definitely nice to have these questions coming through. Um, James, tell us real quick, like, how can people get a hold of you? What, like, where are you at on social media? Yeah, so I'm, I've been doing less and less of it. Um, just kind of got burnt out of the, the whole thing, but I still have my kind of like a public Facebook page where I post the odd thing and, you know, the odd article or links to stuff I'm doing. Um, so I think it's, Facebook is, uh, I think it's the real James Tyler Johnson is the 
is the tag there. And um, yeah, so that's kind of, or else my email people can reach me at is James Tyler Johnson, all one word at live.com. So if anyone ever wants to reach out to me, um, those two ways, but, um, but yeah, um, that's kind of, I kind of, I don't know. I haven't been doing much, as much in that world the last little bit, but. Yeah. Well, in 2020 has been a little rough on everyone and, you know. It's, yeah. I just try to avoid social media at all times, you know, during 20, <laughs> during yeah. all this craziness that's going on. But. <laughs> oh, that's, I should take your advice on that. I should just, yeah. I should totally take your advice on that. So, all right. That's, well, today actually. Today, actually, I was thinking about the last time I saw you in person, I think, was when we rolled through town on our way back from from uh, that exit. We did a big uh, urban search and rescue exercise in Indiana, and yeah. uh, a couple of us um, drove a truck and trailer back from Indiana back to Vancouver, and uh, and it was awesome that we could uh, tee up and, and uh, connect with you and hang out for a bit. Yeah, it was great, man. I remember you guys uh, had stayed just north of where I live, and you and I ended up going to the band store. And uh, yeah, <laughs> there is <laughs> it's still there. There's still the yeah. store. I go to it all the yeah. time. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. I went to the mall and hung out. It was yeah, it was good, man. Great to connect. Yeah. Well, that's and I said, you know, this is obviously pre-COVID, but I remember we had that conversation. I'm like, hey, man, you know, I'll come up and see you, and you guys can come down here, and the families can get together, and then all uh, the whole world kind of just stopped so yeah yeah and right now i'm we still um if i come anywhere down there i gotta do the whole self-quarantine for 14 days so yeah. you know i have these lots of things that postponed from uh from 2020 coming into 2021 and i you know i still there's some conferences where i'm like i don't know if i'm gonna I don't know if I can come down or do these things because i don't know if i can self-quarantine for 14 days on the back side of it um, you know, just with work and everything else going on. So, yeah, so yeah, it's a, it's a lot of uncertainty that way. It's uh really cramping my style. You know, I'm looking at FDIC coming up and I was like, I, I don't want to be, you know, standing on the sidelines watching. <laughs> I might have to take some holiday time so I can do my 14 day quarantine after FDIC. But yeah, no, and it's definitely, you know, like we snuck up to, I, I shouldn't say we snuck up, we didn't sneak anywhere, but we went and taught in Nebraska and, um, you know, we we had to follow the COVID rules, we had our masks on and everything, but it was so awesome to be able to just go teach, like we, all the guys that were instructing with me were like, dude, thank you for letting us go with you, this was fantastic, like they were so excited, mm -hmm. You know, we'd gotten, we went seven or eight months without doing anything because everything was just shut down. So, yeah, yeah, I've been, uh, we've been lucky here. We we're able to do some training. We did live, I just did live fire today and we had a couple class, um, class we run called First In All Alone. We were able to do it with a couple of fire departments and do some forcible entry. So, we're, it's been nice being able to, to get out and do a little bit of stuff, um, kind of get some reps in, which is great. Absolutely. No, that's awesome. Well, if, if everybody watching, if you want to know more about building construction, definitely look up the stuff that James has already posted. Um, you know, the programs that he does are super, super awesome. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how, you know, what comes next, obviously, when things open back up. And uh, I know we'll definitely, definitely have you back. So thanks again for joining us. Awesome. Yeah, bro. Well, thanks for having me on. And uh, it was a blast. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody take care, be safe, wash your hands, wear your masks, and we'll see you guys soon.